the news. The butcher. Monster. When he arrives, he can smell weird. Your doom arrives with him. There is no escaping. He killed one of my pack Brahmin simply because it was in his way. Lanius. In battle, he seizes the enemy in his jaws. He's a butcher will not let go. The news is sad. To call the news ferocious would be an understatement. He's the best the Legion has to offer. Okay. No. He's the same man. All he cares about is destroying the He's enemy. He's never been defeated in battle. It was thanks to Lanius. He carries all the terrors of the, the East. The goddess of the news. Monster of the East. Call him the monster of the terrors. And there's nothing more to be done. The Marley awaits. The Monster, Terror of the East. Legatus Linnaeus is the commander of Caesar's legions during the Second Battle of Hoover Dam. He's an imposing figure, standing at seven feet tall, wielding a blade larger than the height of his enemies, and dons a unique armor, sculpted to the image of Mars, the Legion's god of war. It's clear he's a force to be reckoned with, but is he truly the legend we all know him as? Or is there more to the man than there is to the myth? The legend of Linnaeus, as told to us by Caesar, goes as follows. In his youth, the warrior that was not yet Linnaeus belonged to a tribe of the Arizona, known formally as the Hydebarks, to which he was their greatest warrior. He was so good, in fact, he often wiped out Legion patrols by himself. The Hydebarks had been in active conflict with the Legion and held out for many months against them. Eventually, the Legion had surrounded the tribe, forcing their hand. The tribe, realizing their defeat, surrendered and bent their knee to Kaisar in order to avoid total extermination. Only the warrior who would become Linnaeus disagreed with this act of cowardice. Seething with rage, he went insane and began attacking members of his own tribe. Eventually, he was subdued, but not before 15 of his fellow warriors had fallen to his hand. Kaisar was impressed by him, no doubt before these events due to his capabilities against Legion patrols, but most certainly after this show of violence against the Hydebarks. Kaisar had him rescued, intended to. The warrior was maimed from the battle, his face nearly torn off. Kaisar presented him with a gift and an ultimatum. It was days before he regained consciousness. When he did, I went to his bedside and showed him the helmet I'd had forged to cover his face. I said he could have it if he'd fight for me. He accepted, on condition that he be allowed to kill the surviving males of his tribe. I said, make it the adult males, and you have a deal. And with that, the former Hydebark dies, and the monster of the East is born. But how does the Legion really benefit from this legend? To understand this, we must examine the Legion's culture a bit closer. The Legion believed that the Great War was brought about by Mars, the God of War, who wished to wipe the slate clean so that the Legion could bring civilization back to the world under the rule of his son, Kaisar. This religious belief helps to discipline legionaries and forces them to dedicate themselves to Kaisar and his wishes, as his wishes are the wishes of Mars himself. Kaisar weaponizes this belief with Linnaeus. The legionaries that serve under him have a constant reminder of their holy mission, as the eyes of Mars are literally upon them. The effectiveness of this propaganda is plain and evident in the Mojave, and is even embodied in the Divide, where former legionary marked men craft masks, armor, and weapons in his likeness, even going as far as to name their bumper swords Blade of the West, in direct reference to Linnaeus' Blade of the East. These symbols help to keep these former legionaries anchored in their chaotic surroundings, whether they bear them with malice or admiration. The monster of the East is sewn into every fabric of the Legate's myth. The name Linnaeus means butcher, sending a clear message to friend and foe alike. He wears armor to give him the appearance of Mars himself on the battlefield. 
He has his slaves struck blind so that they may never view his true face. He never fights a losing battle, adding to the ideation that he and the forces he leads are invincible. He enacts fear tactics on his own troops such as the decimation, an ancient Roman punishment for cowardice, where a tenth of a legion would be beaten to death by the other nine tenths. He ensures that his troops are more afraid of the commander behind them than they are the enemy before them. This propaganda proves extremely effective throughout the events of New Vegas. His presence bolsters the morale of the Legion while simultaneously decreasing the morale of its enemies. The Monster of the East proves a valuable weapon in Kaisar's arsenal. But what of the man? Who is Linnaeus, really? Nearly everything we know of Linnaeus is conjecture, derived from the many stories told to us from the various sources throughout the Mojave and even members within the Legion itself provide contradictory accounts. We do have a few facts about him that we can cement. He is a seven-foot-tall monster of a man. His slaves are, in fact, blinded. His face is indeed scarred, as in his legend. But there isn't much else we can determine without deciphering the accounts of his backstory. We hear from head Praetorian Lucius that Linnaeus was in fact born into the Legion, and that his natural abilities allowed him to become a full legionary by the age of 12. We also hear from Antony that it took years to conquer Linnaeus' tribe, the Hydebarks, and that after their surrender, the warriors were granted clemency and allowed into the ranks of the Legion rather than a gruesome death at the hands of Linnaeus. Another of these accounts comes from Kaisar's former right-hand man, Joshua Graham. He states that he does not know Linnaeus, and believes that he has no interest in leading anyone, unless it's in battle. From these accounts, we can formulate an alternate backstory for Linnaeus. One not born from legend, but through the crucible that is Kaisar's legion, became one. First, we must navigate the details of these accounts for their potential truths. To begin, let's take a look at Lucius. Lucius is one of the oldest members in the Legion. He has been in the Praetorian Guard for 13 years. From what we know of the ranking system, he would have to have been equal in skill and experience to that of a Centurion before having been extended an invite to join the Praetorian Guard. It's likely that it would take no less than 10 years to reach the rank of Centurion from that of Recruit. We speculate this as Chief Hanlon explains that Kaisar's veterans have all been serving for roughly a decade, and we know that it's from this pool that Centurions are chosen. This means that he has been in the Legion for at least 23 years, which is enough time to have seen Linnaeus either as a baby or as a child and since the Legion was much smaller at that time. It's likely that Lucius would have known him personally, and could personally attest to his natural abilities, especially if they were of the same rank, or in a close hierarchy such as Deconis and his Contabernia. It's highly likely that Lucius had personally seen Linnaeus in battle, that is to say, if we believe his account to be factual. The second account from Antony is more problematic. In Antony's account, he states that it took years to conquer Linnaeus' tribe, and that all the warriors were allowed to join the Legion after the tribe had been conquered. He makes no mention of Linnaeus killing anyone from that tribe like the legend states. Furthermore, we know that the Hydebarks were the 67th tribe conquered, and were conquered between the first and second battle of Hoover Dam. Julius Caesar would often exaggerate how little time it took him to conquer tribes, how little forces he lost, and how great the losses were for his enemies. All of this was propaganda to show how effective and powerful he was as a leader, and how his legions were invincible. It's likely that our Kaisar does the same thing. Where he states it took months to surround the Hydebarks, it's not a stretch to believe it took actual years. I believe the Legion had been trying to conquer the Hydebarks since before the First Battle of Hoover Dam, if this were the case, and only managed to conquer them as the events of the First Battle of Hoover Dam came to a close. During the four years between the Battles of the Dam, Linnaeus was on campaign in the East, conquering tribes and absorbing them into the Legion. 
so if he came from the Hyde Barks, it would have had to have been directly following the first battle of Hoover Dam, and not much longer after this. This is to say that if Antony saw the conquering of the Hyde Barks, there is no realistic way that Linnaeus could have come from their tribe, since Linnaeus is the legate who conquered Antony's tribe in the four years between the two battles of Hoover Dam. But if Antony didn't see the Hyde Barks conquered, then perhaps he was informed of their true initiation into the Legion by a legionary who saw it with their own eyes, or maybe one from the tribe, revealing a potential nugget of truth into the origin of Linnaeus. In the Divide, we meet Ulysses, a former Frumentari of Caesar's Legion and the main antagonist of the DLC. Ulysses is a man obsessed with symbolism, and he reveals to us many details of the Legion, from its history to its customs and ideations. We can even learn a great deal about Linnaeus and his battle tactics from Ulysses. However, the only notable bit of information we get from him in regards to Linnaeus's backstory is that Ulysses isn't sure if he is even the same man under the mask. This could mean many things, but in the context to which it's said, it's likely that this statement isn't meant in the literal sense of Linnaeus being a different person each time. But rather, it's allegorical, a testament to the lengths Linnaeus will go to obscure his identity, to friend and foe alike. Lastly, we have Graham. He states, I don't know Linnaeus, but from what I've heard, he has no interest in leading anyone unless it's in battle. Many in the Fallout community find it questionable if Linnaeus was in the Legion that Graham wouldn't have known of him, since his skills were so remarkable, and he would have stood out amongst the Legionaries. However, in the context to which he makes this statement, he's saying that he doesn't know him personally, but he certainly knows of him. Knows his tactics, his brutality, his distaste for statesmanship. All indicators that he likely heard of him through the grapevine while still in the Legion. Harkening back to the account of Lucius, Graham was a legate from the minute the Legion was birthed into the wasteland. He very likely didn't concern himself with his inferiors, and only commanded them as whole units in battle. This could explain why he never truly knew Linnaeus. However, it's equally as likely he hadn't heard of Linnaeus until after the events of the First Battle of Hoover Dam since the legionary who would be Linnaeus might not have been made into the legend yet. Each of these accounts provides pieces of this puzzle, enough to begin formulating a thesis. This is what I believe to be the true origin of Legatus Linnaeus, using the in-game evidence, character statements, and conjecture based on Legion's lore, function, and ranking to determine a proper timeline of events. In the early days of Caesar's Legion, they began to expand throughout Arizona, absorbing tribe after tribe along the way. A man from one of these tribes would be born into the Legion and raised as a warrior. This man, whose physical height and strength allowed him to stand out, would begin excelling in training, and eventually, battle. He would become a fully-fledged legionary by the age of 12, where he would continue to serve and climb the ranks. Perhaps in one of his battles, his face was mauled, leaving it heavily scarred. Or perhaps he accumulated the scars over the course of his career. Either way, he eventually would gain recognition for his leadership and strategies, having never once lost a battle. After years of service, he would be promoted to Centurion, where he would begin to lead larger battles with more troops, all for the glory of Mars. This would continue until one day, tragedy struck. The Legion lost the battle for Hoover Dam. Demoralized and lost without the Malpais Legate, the Legion would enter into a state of unrest. It was in this moment, Kaisar realized he would lose more than just the battle for the dam if he allowed his legion to continue down this path. He began formulating a myth, the Monster of the East, to act as a rallying point for the legion, and it just so happened that he had the perfect legionary for the job. He sent for one of his Centurions, a man of great strength, intellect, and strategy. He presented him with his new armor and helm, and dictated to him his new role. 
It was in this moment that Linnaeus as we know him was born. Caesar proclaimed him Legatus and spread the legend of him as the greatest warrior of a tribe recently conquered, the Hydebarks. He then sent Linnaeus east to conquer tribals in order to swell the legion's numbers for the second battle of Hoover Dam. These orders had a double purpose. If the legate was to defeat the NCR, he needed experience as a general leading entire armies. This allowed Caesar to assess the skill of his new commander, to see if Linnaeus truly was the monster Caesar made him out to be. The Eastern Campaigns really tested Linnaeus. He states in dialogue that the Eastern Campaign was hard fought and took many years. Lack of tribals for reconditioning made bolstering the legion's ranks difficult. Stretching their supply lines so thin hindered the legion even further. Many casualties came about from the fighting with the Hangdog tribe and against the hordes of wild mongrels in Denver. However, Linnaeus is no fool, and often adapts his strategies to counter his foe at every turn. After many battles against the Hangdogs, Linnaeus devised a strategy to break them. He exploited their religious beliefs and began throwing their dogs onto fires so that the tribals would believe their spirit animals would burn forever in the afterlife. Distraught by this, the Hangdogs surrendered and Linnaeus marched on victorious. The Legion's morale has never been better, his troops stronger than ever, as the Eastern Campaigns created many veterans. Impressed with his new general, Caesar called him West. Now, Linnaeus faces his toughest opponent yet, and his enemies face a monster, the Terror of the East.